Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Worship with First United Methodist Church. We're glad you joined us this morning. We hope you are comfortable in your jammies if you're still in those, or uh, if you've taken your time to get your cup of coffee and, and gotten dressed, we're glad you're still with us in time. Uh, I do have a few quick things I want to make sure I mention to everybody. Um, we are going to be uh, hopefully starting up some things going on, on here soon, uh, but we want to continue to encourage you to pray for the ongoing pandemic. Um, we're, we're still seeing these numbers that we don't like, uh, and we obviously want to see those down. So we want to ask you just to take a moment at some point today uh, when you have some time just to stop and pray wherever you're at uh, for this. We, we are looking forward to seeing the end to what's going on. I know that very well. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we do have some things we need to get done. Uh, so tomorrow morning, if you're available, we want to invite you to join us here at the church building. Uh, at 9 a.m., we're going to start taking some of the Christmas decorations down. Uh, and we want to try to get those as done as quickly as possible um, to allow us to have this space sort of prepared as we hopefully begin to have some conversation about coming back in the com coming weeks. Uh, so if you're available to come help us at 9 a.m., we would love to have you join us. Well, this week we're going to be continuing to look at our uh, sermon series, Failing Faith. And we're going to be talking about how do we develop a faith that is not going to be uh, able to be torn down or destroyed or, or upended by some of the tough things in life, just like we're experiencing right now, possibly. Uh, but before we do that, I want to invite you to spend a few moments with me in prayer right now uh, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. So will you join me as we put this uh, opening prayer on the screen here for you to join us? Let's pray together. In the dark shadow of night, God calls to each and every one of us. Here we are, O oh Lord. Speak to us. Creating God, how deeply and intimately you know us. In the mystery of your love, you see who we are and who we might become. Our bodies are your creation. They are wonderfully made. Our minds reflect your handiwork and our spirits are a gift from you. You have called us each by name, inviting us to follow you more closely. Step by step. Lead us now into the depths of your presence and love. Amen. I pray that you felt God right beside you in these moments as we spend a few moments in prayer together. We're going to invite the praise team to come and join me up here at front. And we're going to start today with some worship and uh, invite you to join us uh, if you're willing to sing along even at home. I know some, sometimes that feels awkward and, and singing by yourself, but uh, we want you to be able to join us in worship. And so even if you are by yourself, let's make a joyful noise together to the Lord as we start by singing with 10,000 reasons this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes And bless the Lord, oh my soul His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to anger Your name Oh, my soul, worship. 
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day. to our uh, scripture and the word that we're going to have to hear from that uh, this morning. Um, we're going to hear about a familiar story that many of us have probably heard several dozen times in our lives uh, as a reminder of God's faithfulness to be with us through things. And uh, so this next song I'm going to invite you to join us in offering and worship this morning is Mighty to Save, which reminds us that um, we have a God who has sent us a Savior that can rescue us. Um, who has redeemed us and restored us to relationship with the Father. So let's join together and sing about this God who is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is my. Salvation 
author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Oh, Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. As I mentioned before, we're going to be hearing from a pretty, pretty familiar passage of Scripture this morning. Um, and we're going to take a look at that as we talk about how do we understand God's faithfulness in the midst of struggles. So this morning, uh, on your screen, you're going to be able to read along with us here at home. Uh, we're going to be reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18. And this is what it has to say. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the, mountain, at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also, anoint Yehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, 
from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Yehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Yehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's offer a word of prayer before we continue. Almighty God, this day may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable worship in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, last week, as we dove into this new sermon series about how our faith can sometimes fail if it isn't built on the right understanding of who God is, we started off by reminding ourselves that life was never promised to be perfect without any suffering at all. And and we also kind of found out God is not a tool like we sometimes operate like. God's not a tool for us to manipulate or control for our own ends. And nor should we somehow assume immediately that just because we have comfort and wealth, that that is somehow God's uh, sign of of favor. Um, While while the blessings we have sometimes are uh, reflected in that, I mean, we can certainly see that in Scripture, and we can certainly know that that can be sometimes true, more often than not, what ends up happening is when we have all that wealth and comfort, it actually sort of blocks our view from seeing what's really going on when God is calling us into an uncomfortable life, how we can sometimes glory in our sufferings for the sake of the gospel. And so what ends up happening is we block our own view of of recognizing the only hope we should really have is Jesus Christ. You know, it's so easy to forget that our faith isn't about finding a comfortable, plush life that makes things easy. It's about being faithful to God in everything. And more often than not, what I think Scripture tends to indicate is that means we have to get uncomfortable. Leave behind the good life for the sake of loving others and serving a kingdom that is greater than this world. Just ask Elijah how hard it can be to remain faithful in the midst of pain and heartache. Elijah had just finished showing Israel that the false gods of, or the false prophets of Baal were nothing more than fools following a non-existent God. The Lord helped reveal his power and he drew his people back toward him in a magnificent and undeniable way. But within a short time, Jezebel, the queen of Israel, who led those people to worship the false god Baal, made it clear to Elijah that he was as good as dead. And Elijah, the only prophet of Yahweh left in the land, fled as soon as he heard that word from Jezebel. The brave prophet of God, who stood alone on that mountain against hundreds of prophets of Baal, was unable to overcome those circumstances, and it made him operate out of fear. He ends up hiding in the wilderness and asks God to take his life because he can no longer bear the painful experience he's going through. In 2016, Martin Scorsese adapted a book by the name of Silence, written by Shusaku Endo, into a movie. And the story tells about these two priests who sail to Japan in hopes of both sharing the gospel as well as tracking down a mentor of theirs who may have actually renounced his faith. The main character named Rodriguez has dreams of grandeur in missionary work. But he ends up only finding persecution and suffering. Japan at the time had outlawed Christianity. And even just getting to Japan in the first place proves difficult for Rodriguez and his partner. And when they finally make it to Japan, when they finally arrive after all the hard hard, uh, travel, what they find is anything but ideal. The physical conditions they experience in Japan are abhorrent. Lice infest their hair and clothes. The weather is an everlasting sauna. And they live under a constant threat of capture. So as the story unfolds, several of the people that Rodriguez ministers to wind up dead. His missionary partner drowns. And Rodriguez eventually finds himself imprisoned For his faith. He laments, Lord, why are you silent? Why 
are you always silent? It's easy for us to feel like Elijah and Rodriguez when life gets tough. We feel like God has gone silent in our lives. And we might even be tempted to feel like God has somehow forgotten us. We want God to show up in explosively magnificent ways to reinvigorate us. We want the fanfare, the light show, and the fireworks from God as proof of his presence. But God doesn't always operate in the spectacular. Elijah, hiding out on a, in a cave on Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, experiences three powerful shows of force. A mighty wind, an earthquake, and a roaring fire. But the scripture makes sure we understand something very vital about these dangerous natural phenomena that happened there. God was not in the wind. God was not in the earthquake. And God was not in the fire. It's only after the text reveals this reality to us that we find God showing up in a gentle whisper. Some have even described this quietness of this whisper as the sound of one hand clapping. Go ahead, try that at home. Try, just try to clap one hand. It, it, you, you can barely make a noise. And even that noise that you can make is barely louder than a whisper. And it is in that kind of a whisper that God's presence is finally revealed to Elijah. God taught Elijah an important lesson that we would do well to heed today. Sometimes God works in groundbreaking, earth-shattering miracles, many of which Elijah himself experienced during his earthly ministry. Yes, sometimes God is in the wind, sometimes God is in the earthquake, and sometimes God is in the fire. Sometimes God's presence is so clear in front of us that we cannot deny it. But sometimes, and I think more often, God comes to us in a gentle whisper, a nudge, a warmth, a simple moment of calm. All in all, these moments remind us that whatever is happening in our circumstances doesn't last forever. It's easy to think God has somehow vanished from our lives when things seem dark and our cries feel like they go unanswered. Like Elijah, we sort of limp through a desert, wandering and feeling abandoned in our hour of need. We might even cry out to the heavens, demanding to know where God might be. Where's the wind and the fire? Where's the healing? The miraculous signs and wonders. God, where are you? But here's the truth we find in Scripture. God doesn't abandon us in our pain. He will whisper to us in all sorts of ways. A picturesque mountain view. A poignant piece of art. Sometimes it's just a cup of coffee. Or even through a passage of Scripture as we turn our attention to it, looking for him. As Elijah finds God at that cave on Mount Horeb, there's something else we need to pay close attention to here. A, a very subtle detail that we might miss if we gloss over it. You see, Mount Horeb is generally accepted to be another name for Mount Sinai. And that was the place where God himself established a covenant with Israel through Moses after escaping from Egypt captivity. The fact that God met Elijah here specifically should call not only us, but Elijah himself, who said, I'm no better than my ancestors, to recognize God's faithfulness to those ancestors. Even though the present seemed bleak, God didn't forget about the people who had come before this prophet, and he wouldn't forget about Elijah either. And even though Elijah seems convinced that he is all alone in his love for God and that there is no point in even fighting on, we find out there are others who are on his side, who would come to his aid. Along with those names that, that God lists there in that passage, we find out there are 7,000 other Israelites who have not bowed a knee to this false god Baal. Elijah was not going to finish his prophetic work alone. 
A.O. Scott tells about this bizarre true story in a book called Better Living Through Criticism. A few years ago, there was a performance artist by the name of Maria Abramovic who crafted this presentation called The Artist is Present. For months, Abramovic sat down at a table in New York's Museum of Modern Art and looked into the eyes of exhibit visitors who one by one sat down across from her. Abramovic didn't speak, she didn't laugh, and she didn't make any abundant hand gestures like I tend to do. She simply stared. She looked at them. People lined up for hours for a chance to sit across from Abramovic for about 30 seconds. Can you imagine waiting hours for 30 seconds to just sit across from someone you've probably never even heard of? But what many people find bizarre is that there were scores of individuals who left the artist is present in tears, overcome with emotion at Abramovic's gaze, they couldn't help but weep. Scott says this about the exhibit in his book. The attraction Abramovic exerted simply by announcing and sustaining her presence was perhaps a measure of and a temporary antidote to the profound alienation we feel from one another and from ourselves. What does it say about us that we have to go to an art museum to find connection with another soul? How often does the world around us seem to indicate that we have to face our struggles alone? Too often the mentality is that we cannot and must not show weakness through our suffering. Rather, we are responsible for pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and not allowing anyone into our hurts and our pains to help us. Doing so would somehow be disastrous to us. Yet between the teachings of Scripture and the reality that we have now with the modern understanding of emotions and psychology, we must realize that seeking help from others is exactly what God often points us to do. We were never meant to bear the burdens of life on our own apart from the care and love of others, especially when it feels like too much to manage alone. And God's work in the past is a reminder of what he can still do for us now. He will not leave us nor forsake us. And what is the greatest sign of the presence of God in our lives? Jesus. Rather than leaving us to die in our own sin, Jesus came to earth to redeem us. And even death could not keep him down. Too often I think we'd rather wallow in self-pity and defeat than recognize the God who sits right beside us. It might come in the form of a mighty wind, an earthquake, or a fire. Or more likely, it will come in a quiet presence. It might even be that God sends messengers to us in the form of others who love us in the midst of our misery. Be them friends, family, or church family. Even if they don't have the answers. Simply knowing someone is with us, like Abramovic in that art exhibit, speaks volumes to remind us that the storms of this life will eventually pass. And above all, when times are difficult and we struggle to hear God's voice, we can find hope and peace in looking to the person of Jesus Christ. In his dying on the cross, Christ was thinking of you and me. He didn't want a kingdom of God without us. He didn't want us to miss out on the wonderful, restored creation where death, pain, suffering, and crying we're no longer a reality. Let's hold on to that reality. That God is for us who are in Jesus Christ. And even when God feels silent in our lives, he's still there, whispering words of love and mercy. Amen.
I want to invite you to, invite you to join me now in a prayer together. This prayer of confession. We're going to put this up on the screen so you can join us at home. We invite you to pray this prayer with us and then spend a few moments of silent prayer together, wherever you're at. Whether you need to offer something to God or just open yourself up to hearing God in those moments, that's what that time is for. So let's join together in this prayer of confession and spend a few moments of silent prayer together. Oh God, you call to us. We hear you, but aren't sure who is calling. We hear you, but are distracted by other voices and noises. We hear you, but are afraid to answer. Forgive us. Open our hearts to your voice. Help us set aside our doubts, our fears, and our distractions, that we may answer you faithfully. Amen. Spend a few moments now in silent prayer. Now hear these words of assurance. God has not abandoned you. God has never left our side. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sins. And we have the opportunity to be in relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within each and every one of us. To know that no matter how rough things get, God will bring to to fruition, that work that he began in each of us and in this world. Hold on to that and be at peace. Amen. The praise team is going to come back up here and uh, join me here. We're going to offer another song of worship this morning. Um, and this song we're going to sing next is uh, Forever Rain. Uh, and it's one of my personal favorite uh, songs to, to offer in worship. Um, but it's a reminder that um, no matter what happens, no matter how good we think we are, um, God is better. Uh, and even when there's no hope, when it feels like things are at their bleakest, God is our peace, our joy, and our life. So let's join together in worship as we sing Forever Rain. good you are good when there's nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sin yeah You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. Thank you. 
for a moment now. Uh, I want to take a moment to just offer a word of prayer and a, a word of encouragement to you, um, even as we are not gathered in person, uh, to continue faithfully in offering to God your gifts, your tithes, your offerings. Uh, you can mail those here to the church or, or to the treasurer. Um, we can get to that address if you need it. But we want to encourage you um, to not give in to the temptation to think that just because we aren't together that the church somehow has stopped being the church. That the work of God is somehow being impeded by this. Because even as it is different, the work of God continues. And God is with us. And we want to be faithful to giving to him so that that light that we just sang about in a couple of songs here this morning continues to shine brightly through us and through what we are able to give to those who are doing that work. And, and finding the ways for us to plug into that work. And, and, and giving our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. That's just one great way. Uh, to make sure that God's work is continuing, but to also offer our hands, our time, our service to whatever we can find uh, in the midst of, of suffering and, and drawing alongside of the brokenhearted people in the world who need to know that hope. So let's offer a word of prayer together over these, these gifts this morning. Giver of all good things, Lord, uh, we just thank you for the blessings we have received, for the resources, uh, the wealth of, of all kinds that you have gifted us. Lord, we don't take for granted the fact that all good things come from you and that that means they belong ultimately to you, not us. We've simply been offered to be stewards of what you've given us. And Lord, we want to be faithful stewards, not, not hoarding for ourselves, not keeping uh, for our personal gain, but to give you glory through serving others, to let them know the same love that has gripped our hearts and transformed our lives. For the king who does reign forever on that throne. So, Lord, we pray a special blessing over the gifts that we give to you, that they might be multiplied and used for a glory that surpasses the one that we could ever imagine. And, God, if it doesn't show up in the magnificent, spectacular ways, God, maybe, maybe it's just a whisper. Maybe this gift that we offer is just a gentle nudge to someone in some way that reminds them of the power that you hold in this world to change lives for the better. So God, may your kingdom come as your will is done on this world. And may heaven be reflected through all that we say and do as it grips us more each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close worship this morning, I uh, pulled out a song that uh, came, uh, happened to just glance through the uh, folder uh, as I was trying to uh, pray about what God was, was offering to me to, to use for worship this morning and, and came across this song from 2003 called Grace Like Rain, and this song um, takes a uh, familiar song, Amazing Grace, and, and it's just another uh, take on that, that old uh, familiar hymn, uh, but it invites us to, to sing hallelujah to God, because even as we are, are struggling through life, we recognize that God's grace rains down on us and, and washes us uh, uh, clean. 
Uh, it takes away the sin, the stain um, that, that was on us and makes us new again, makes us um, white as snow. And so I want to invite you to join us this morning as we offer this closing song of worship to remind us that God's grace falls like rain in our lives. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see so clear. Because of the grace of God, our stains have been washed away, and that grace falls like a refreshing rain in the midst of a hot summer day. So may that grace wash over you today. Whatever it is you have next, 
may God go with you. And may you remember that God never, ever leaves those who are in Jesus Christ alone. Whether that be through the presence of a nudge in the Holy Spirit, or may that, may that be through someone who draws alongside of you in the dark times. Know that God is with you as you go in peace. Amen.